I started fishing when I was knee-high to a grasshopper. The first fish I remember catching was a couple pound catfish, but because I was so small, I could have swore, and I did, that it was a full-grown shark. That first fish was the first of what must have been hundreds of thousands of fish that I caught out of Grand Lake of the Cherokees in northeastern Oklahoma. My family grew up in southwestern Missouri in the Ozarks, but we'd visit my grandparents' cabin on the lake during the weekends in the summertime. If you're unfamiliar with Grand Lake, it's a man-made reservoir. As a kid, I had no idea, but it was a reservoir for a hydroelectric dam, and as I grew older, I could see the power lines crisscrossing around the landscape. Like many folks, my grandfather taught me about fishing. He'd tell me stories about how great fishing used to be. He'd say you'd have to stand behind a tree to bait your hook, and in doing so, that way the fish wouldn't jump out of the water and grab the bait out of your hand. While that may have been a bit of a fish story, the point remained. Fishing used to be better. And as I grew up, I had a better understanding of what that meant. And in fact, not all fish are as safe to eat nowadays as what they used to be. And that's the beginning of how my love of fishing led to my career in clean energy. You see, some large predatory fish like bass, gar, catfish, tuna, and yes, sharks, consume smaller prey and accumulate mercury. There are mercury consumption advisories all across this country in various waterways. And the number one source of mercury contamination comes from coal-fired power plants. My fishing interest reached an apex in college when I started taking biology courses on stream ecology, macroinvertebrates, and entomology. That's bugs. And it was right around this same time that I was so close to some of the best fly fishing waters in the Ozarks, just an hour away. And for a part-time job, I even worked at the granddaddy of all the outdoor stores, Bass Pro Shops in Springfield, Missouri. And at that exact same time, my local electric company announced plans to build another coal-fired power plant. And I knew that that coal-fired power plant would have negative effects on the waterways that I love. That's when I had a light bulb moment. I realized if I wanted to protect the waterways I loved and keep them healthy, I had to do something. But I knew that those spirally little light bulbs installed at my home weren't going to be enough to stop this coal-fired power plant. And I had not a clue how my electric company even operated. So after some research, I found out that wind power and energy efficiency are low-cost alternatives. At the time, solar power and natural gas were a little too expensive, but they too were alternatives. After several years of work and research, my city and electric company decided to build the coal-fired power plant anyway. And I felt powerless. So how do you begin to make your electric company better? I've got a little secret to share. Most electric companies are government-approved monopolies. Have you ever wondered why there's an electric company on the Monopoly board game? Electric companies aren't like grocery stores. You can't pick and choose which ones you want. See, at the beginning of the 19th century, the primary model in developing electric companies was reliant on heavy expenditures, and cities could only withstand so many competing power lines crisscrossing over streets and tearing up sidewalks. So the power companies began to consolidate and create natural monopolies. In many cases, there was little to no competition, but in return, they were meant to be regulated by someone. That someone, the someone who's supposed to protect the public, the ratepayer, the customer, is different depending on what type of electric company. You see, in the late 1890s, large for-profit power companies found that cities were the places to make the most profit, leaving smaller towns in the dust. Those larger for-profit power companies are usually regulated by things called public service commissions. Visionary city leaders would often announce plans to create their own not-for-profit municipal 
but government-run electric companies. These not-for-profit smaller electric companies are usually run by city councils and mayors. In 1896, a small southern Louisiana town decided that they needed their own electric company. After a citywide vote approving the government-run company, Lafayette, Louisiana developed Lafayette Utilities System. Let's think about this for a moment. This is a time and a place in history where these people had never seen electricity. They weren't experts. They didn't know how electricity was even generated. But they had a vision, and that vision's a very powerful thing. These people are called power adapters. They see a better future and work for it today. At that time, virtually no one in the country had electricity. In fact, in 1896, there were no toasters, no vacuum sweepers. There was no rotary telephone. The primary mode of transportation was still the horse and buggy. At that time in history, Thomas Edison, you know, the guy with the light bulb, he was fighting with Nikola Tesla about what type of electricity would be best. Thomas Edison's direct current power, or DC power, or Nikola Tesla's alternating current, or AC power. This fight between Edison's DC power and Tesla's AC power is called the current wars. See, at the time, a lot of people thought Tesla's AC power was too dangerous to use. But that didn't scare Lafayette. In fact, Lafayette had electricity nearly 40 years before President Roosevelt's New Deal helped electrify the nation. Meanwhile, Lafayette, Louisiana gets to hang our hats alongside these powerful power adapters. You see, we still live with the impacts of those power adapters today. Thomas Edison created a number of power companies, including Consolidated Edison in New York. He also created the General Electric Company. Nikola Tesla won the current wars. So the power flowing through your house and this building is alternating current. Elon Musk, one of today's power adapters, is paying tribute to Nikola Tesla with his Tesla Motor Company, an all-electric car company. And President Roosevelt's New Deal created the Tennessee Valley Authority, which generated the power necessary to build the world's first atomic bombs and put an end to World War II. His New Deal also created my favorite lake, Grand Lake of the Cherokees in northeastern Oklahoma. Meanwhile, Lafayette, Louisiana gets to hang its hat on history as well. Nowadays, southern Louisiana is better known as being at the heart of the oil and gas industry. But in this century, Lafayette again flexed its power adapter muscles. This time, it was with fiber internet. You see, very few cities had gigabit internet service, and the very large for-profit private companies didn't see Lafayette as a valuable customer base. So in 2004, the citizens of Lafayette, Louisiana, banded together to launch LUS Fiber. This is at a time when there weren't iPhones. There was no YouTube. In 2004, there was this thing called America Online, AOL. They had 25 million subscribers on dial-up internet. Nowadays, you know, we can see that dial-up internet is dead. AOL used to be a power adapter, but now they're a punchline in a TEDx talk. So what happens when a former power adapter unplugs? For many of us, we take for granted that the future is going to arrive on time, under budget, and without controversy. That's not always the case. When my family moved to Lafayette in 2011, we were pretty excited to move to a place that we thought was looking forward. And we bought a house that was built in the 1980s. We immediately noticed how high our electric bills were. So we started make the house, making the house more energy efficient. And in 2012, we installed solar panels on that house. Pretty soon, we saw our electric bills go from $200 a month all the way down to $6 per month. You see, solar families like mine rely on a policy called net metering, 
whereby your panels over-generate power during the day and your electric meter spins backwards. The power flows to your neighbors and your utility gets to claim that power as their own as they sell it to your neighbors. At the end of the month, everything's netted up and then you get your $6 electric bill. We rely on those common and fair policies in order to make decisions on what type of investments we make for our own homes. But in October of 2016, I discovered that my local electric company had changed its net meter policy. Buried in a 60-page ordinance was a small section changing the net meter policy for Lafayette utility system. And it didn't spell out the word solar, and it didn't tell about the implications to solar families like mine. Not to get too deep into the details, the new solar change was going to levy over $200 in additional fees to my family every single year. For folks that were considering installing solar panels of their own, they effectively would have never paid for themselves because of the new fees. I was so shocked, I immediately began getting plugged in. I worked with a number of solar homeowners nearby and solar panel installer companies, and we started telling the story of what had happened. We dubbed it the solar tax, because after all, my government approved monopoly utility was setting these new fees on solar homeowners. We wrote a blog describing the issue. That blog got picked up in local news media, and then it went viral on social media. Probably hundreds of thousands of people all across the country were similarly shocked by the solar tax. We started having people contact our city council asking that something be done. And within a week, it was announced that the solar tax would be rescinded. We had won. But as a fisherman, you don't go home after you catch one small fish. And as a power adapter, you don't rest on your laurels and be satisfied with the bare minimum. Keep in mind, the victory over the solar tax should never have had to happen in the first place. This is the 21st century. We need to be rewarding innovation, not punishing it, and looking forward to the next big thing. And many communities are doing just that. Communities like Lincoln, Nebraska, where they're getting 48% of their electricity today from renewable energy resources. Or Eastern Kentucky Power Cooperative, where residents can rent solar panels and reduce their electric bills remotely. Or Kansas City, Missouri, where they're actually paying people and offering incentives to buy electric vehicles. Or Austin, Texas, where They've avoided building several massive power plants just by being more energy efficient. And Springfield, Missouri, do you remember that first town that got me fired up about energy issues? Even though Springfield went ahead and built that coal-fired power plant, today they're also buying wind power and solar power at a lower cost than that new coal unit. And they just recently announced that they are shutting down one of their older coal-fired power plants. Those communities are planning for their future. And your community can too. So what's the next big thing? Here we are at the beginning of the 21st century. We're in a new energy era. Communities all across the country are facing a crossroads. Do we want to become the next Tesla or AOL? Power plants are 30 to 50 year investments. The decisions we make today will affect our children's children. Maybe this is your light bulb moment and you're thinking, I should really do something, but I'm not an expert and I don't even know where my power comes from. Well, that's okay. In 1896, Lafayette didn't have a clue either. But they did have a vision and that's a very powerful thing. We are more empowered to make positive changes in our community and electric companies than we may realize. It's time for everyone to become power adapters and get plugged in. Sure, you may need to learn who your city council members are and what the public service commissions do, but those people are elected to serve you. Contact them. Give them your vision. 
light their way. And if you'll indulge one final pun, join me and let's flip the switch for our community and move into the future.